Hello, welcome to this session, Generating Evidence in Private Practice. My name is Brendan McKenzie, and I'm hoping in the next half an hour to convince you that generating research evidence in your practice is something that you can do, and something that would significantly benefit not only you as an individual veterinarian, but your patients and our profession as a whole. First, a little background on me. I did my bachelor's degree in English literature and biology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. I then completed a master's degree in animal behavior at San Francisco State University with the intention of being a primatologist. However, I had the opportunity to work with some veterinarians and I quickly fell in love with veterinary medicine. So in 2001, I completed my veterinary degree at the University of Pennsylvania. Like many of us in the profession, I consider myself a lifelong learner, and I am especially interested in how research evidence serves as the foundation for clinical practice and how we can take research evidence and use it to do better patient care. As a result of this, I did a master's degree in epidemiology in 2015 at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I've been in small animal private practice for 20 years, most of that time working at Adobe Animal Hospital, a large practice in the San Francisco Bay Area. In addition to my clinical work, I now work as Director of Veterinary Medicine for Loyal. Loyal is a biotechnology startup located in San Francisco, and our mission is to understand the causes and the manifestations of aging in dogs, and to develop therapies to slow aging and reduce age-associated disease. I've also been the author of the SkeptVet blog since 2009, and this has been an outlet for me to promote science-based and evidence-based medicine in the veterinary field. In 2019, I published a book, Placebos for Pets, which takes a science-based look at many of the alternative therapies currently available for veterinary patients. Peter Rostell was an equine practitioner from the late 1950s until the early 2000s. He was ahead of his time in many ways. In 1978, he wrote an article in the Canadian Veterinary Journal making much the same case that I hope to make today that the veterinary profession and veterinary patients benefit by breaking down the barriers between academic practice, research, teaching, and private clinical practice. All of our patients and all veterinarians benefit from mixing the activities of research, teaching, and clinical practice together. So how exactly does having private practice veterinarians involved in research benefit veterinarians and veterinary medicine as a whole? Well, one way in which it provides a benefit is better quality evidence. Right now, most of the research done in veterinary medicine is done in academic institutions, and this has some limitations. For one thing, the questions that are asked and the subjects that are studied by academic veterinarians may not always be relevant to those of us in private clinical practice. I'm sure you've all had the experience of reading journal articles about very interesting but rather obscure topics and wondering, how is this going to help me or my patients? So the more involved we as practitioners are in veterinary research, the more pragmatic research questions we will be able to see answered. Research that is done in academic institutions is also often done in populations of animals that are not representative of the general pet population. The dogs, for example, who go to a university hospital may be different in terms of their health conditions, their lifestyle, the resources available to their owners than the dogs that you or I will see in a small private practice. Research done in general practice improves the quality of the population available to study and makes the evidence generated more applicable to general private practice populations. Finally, there is simply a limitation on the number of studies and the number of study subjects available to academic veterinarians. Only so many people will take their pets to a university hospital and participate in a research study. If private practitioners become more involved in research and more research is done in the private practice setting, we will have more studies and larger populations, and this will improve the quality of the evidence available to us. In addition to improving the quality and the quantity of the evidence available to us as clinicians, I believe that participating in research as a private practitioner has other benefits for veterinarians as well. One of these, I think, is that it makes us better clinicians. Understanding how research evidence is developed and produced helps us to practice in a more evidence-based way. All research evidence has limitations and we have to critically evaluate the evidence and understand how to apply it judiciously to patients in clinical practice. It's easier for us to do this if we have direct personal experience of participating in research and generating research evidence. I also believe that participating in clinical research is a source of personal and professional development for veterinarians that can improve their satisfaction in their work. As a 
practitioner who's been in practice for many, many years, some aspects of clinical medicine are less challenging and less interesting than they were once upon a time. And participating in research is another way for me to learn new skills and new information and to grow as a veterinarian. In some cases, participating in clinical research can also be a source of revenue for veterinary practices. Research conducted on behalf of the animal health industry and the development of new medicines, for example, is often something that veterinarians can be paid to do. Having skills as a study site investigator, being able to conduct research in your practice, is not only personally and professionally fulfilling, but potentially another source of income. Finally, I believe that as a veterinarian, I benefit from participating in research through the impact on my clients. Pet owners are often very motivated to help contribute to veterinary research, particularly research that involves health problems that they've experienced in their own pets. We call this citizen science. And right now, I think pet owners are more motivated than ever to see a growth in the research evidence available to veterinarians so that we can provide more and better care for their pets. If I participate as a veterinarian in practice in research projects, I think I can tap into that enthusiasm in my clients. And then in return, my clients will appreciate both the work that I do as an investigator and a researcher, as well as the work I do as a clinician taking care of their individual pets. Greater client engagement and enthusiasm and appreciation for the skills and knowledge of veterinarians is one of the benefits we get from participating in clinical research. There are, of course, challenges for veterinarians interested in getting involved in research. Time is probably one of the most familiar, since we are always very limited in the time that we have available in private practice. Learning the skills necessary to produce research evidence does take some time, and potentially efforts devoted to producing research evidence might take away from our ability to see clinical cases. Some veterinarians are concerned that this may be a source of reduced revenue for them. However, as I pointed out, oftentimes research evidence can produce revenue as well in private practice if it's something that we commit ourselves to doing on an ongoing basis. In human medicine, there is an entire infrastructure available to support research in practice, and this is not in most places available in veterinary medicine. So this is something that needs uh, investment on the part of academic institutions and industry to make it more practical for private clinicians to participate in research. And then, of course, training of veterinarians and staff is necessary in order to give us the knowledge and skills that we need to produce research evidence in practice. The kinds of skills that we need, I'll go over when I talk about some of the specific types of research evidence that we can produce, but there are also sometimes requirements from regulatory agencies if we're going to conduct clinical trials, and that's something that we need to spend some time learning before we can jump into the research field. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the types of evidence that can be produced in clinical practice. This is a version of the evidence pyramid, which I'm sure you've all seen many times before. In this particular version, I break down the available research evidence that you might use to support clinical decisions into general categories based on the reliability of that evidence and the availability of that evidence. So the most available and the least reliable, of course, is ordinary clinical experience. We learn a lot from our experience as veterinarians, but unstructured, uncontrolled observations are fraught with all kinds of errors. And so as a result, while clinical experience is readily available to us, it is not the most reliable form of evidence. Similarly, expert opinion is often relied upon by private practitioners such as myself as a type of evidence to support the recommendations that we make to clients. It's important to remember, though, that expert opinion is in itself a type of clinical experience. Often it is supported by research evidence and by direct experience of research because specialists are more likely to be involved in research than general practitioners. But expert opinion is still a relatively unreliable and uncontrolled form of evidence. The primary literature is what most of us think about when we think of research evidence and evidence-based medicine. These are all of the reports of individual types of studies that are published in journals. This is a rich source of information, but it is also a lot of work to access and to understand. To utilize the primary literature as a practitioner, I have to know how to find the research that's relevant to the questions that I have, how to critically appraise it and understand its limitations, and then apply that to my patient population. And that takes some skills that have to be learned as well as a fair bit of time. 
And then finally, there is this what I call the synthetic literature. This is literature that involves other people already doing the work of locating and critically appraising the primary literature. This provides the practitioner with evidence that is already filtered and assessed in a way that makes it easier for us to understand how reliable that evidence is and how applicable it might be to the patients that we're concerned with treating. One type of evidence which I think it's very reasonable for practitioners in private general practice to consider producing is synthetic evidence. It is certainly possible for us to look at the primary literature, to learn the skills of critical appraisal, and to generate systematic reviews and other forms of synthetic evidence that will be useful to other veterinarians. And in doing so, we learn a lot about how evidence is produced and how to critically appraise that evidence ourselves. It is certainly also possible for veterinarians in practice to contribute directly to the primary research literature. Now, most of us think of this in terms of clinical trials or interventional research, and certainly that is something that you can participate in in general practice. However, there are other forms of primary literature that veterinarians can produce with less uh, investment of time and resources that are also very useful to the rest of the profession. Clinical audits and case reports are examples of primary research literature that veterinarians can produce in practice. And then finally, there are uh, ways that we can take our clinical experiences and perhaps our experiences as experts in a particular area of medicine and produce literature or research evidence that is useful to other veterinarians. Narrative reviews are an excellent example of this kind of contribution. Okay, let's talk briefly now about some of the types of evidence that you might consider producing in practice and how that evidence is generated. As I mentioned, synthetic literature is a wonderful place to start because the skills needed to do evidence synthesis are also skills necessary to practice evidence-based medicine in general, to use the research literature in making informed decisions for your own patients. Systematic reviews are a type of synthetic literature that are very useful and that you can, in fact, learn how to produce. Um, Jan Sargent and Annette O'Connor have produced a wonderful guide to systematic reviews in veterinary medicine, and that is a great step-by-step -step toolkit for helping to generate this kind of evidence. Meta-analyses are often included in systematic reviews. Th those do require a certain amount of statistical background that not all veterinarians have, but it is definitely reasonable for veterinarians in practice to consider systematic reviews as a form of evidence that they can produce and that then gives us the opportunity to investigate and learn about the primary literature while sharing what we learn with other veterinarians. Narrative reviews are also a type of synthetic literature, though they tend to be more opinion-based and less critical or less uh, controlled evidence, and that's certainly something that we can produce and share with other veterinarians. And then finally, critically appraised topics are a bit of a middle ground. Critically appraised topics, or CATs, are a type of structured literature review that are not quite as in-depth or involved as a systematic review, but can still be a very useful analysis of specific focused clinical questions. There are guidelines in the research literature on how to produce all of these types of evidence. So I'd like to talk briefly now about these three different types of synthetic literature and compare and contrast them a little bit. Narrative reviews are essentially a review of the primary research literature conducted by one person or a small group of people and it involves really very little specific methodological detail. You pick a topic, you go to the research literature, you find out everything you can about that topic, and then you summarize what you've learned in a review that is then published and shared with other veterinarians. This is a very easy and relatively rapid type of review to produce, but it is also one that has a fairly high risk of bias. You are simply providing your perspective on the research literature, and there are no formal controls for bias or error involved. How comprehensive a narrative review can be depends a bit on the effort uh, that the author puts in and the intention of the review. Critically appraised topics are kind of a middle ground. There is a structured methodology that you can learn to produce a cat, and they do involve some formal search procedures and evidence synthesis. However, they tend to focus on very narrow subjects, and therefore they're much easier and quicker to produce than systematic reviews, and they do have a slightly higher risk of bias because they are not quite as formal in their methodology. 
And then finally, systematic reviews, with or without a meta-analysis, are probably the gold standard. They're the most reliable way to look at the research literature and see how it answers a very specific focal question in veterinary medicine. Um, these do require a fairly advanced knowledge of the methodology of systematic reviews to produce. They do have very explicit search and critical appraisal criteria, so they are less likely to be influenced by individual bias, though no form of literature is completely without bias, and they tend to be more comprehensive at least in so far as they cover all the literature relevant to a specific question. That question, however, can be relatively broad or relatively narrow, depending on the intention of the reviewer. So advantages to systematic reviews is they're fairly objective, and because there is explicit critical appraisal, they give you a very good sense of how strong the literature is in a certain area. Um, they're quite focused. Oftentimes there's a formal method for developing the question to be answered, and so they are a good objective review of research literature around a focused question. The disadvantage, as I said, is they are somewhat complicated to produce. You have to be familiar with how to develop a good question, how to search the literature in a comprehensive and systematic way, and how to conduct a formal critical appraisal of the evidence that you find in order to produce a systematic review. They do focus somewhat more narrowly than narrative reviews, and unfortunately, because the quantity and quality of research evidence in veterinary medicine is often poor, systematic reviews often end up coming to the conclusion that we can't come to any firm conclusion. Systematic reviews often end with some statement that more research is needed in order to make a firm conclusion or decision. And this can be somewhat less useful um, for, for those of us in practice than forms of review that might be less objective but more likely to provide us with guidance. Narrative reviews have rather the opposite advantages and disadvantages. They can be more broadly focused since there are no formal constraints on the type of question that you can ask. They can provide summary of a research area or they can provide a historical overview or even be used as a way of making an argument for a specific point or perspective. They don't require as much technical skill to write. You do have to be able to identify the research literature around a certain subject, but because there's no formal methodological critical appraisal involved, um, they are less dependent on whether the evidence available is strong or weak. That, of course, is also the downfall of narrative reviews because they inherently incorporate the bias of the authors and they do not control for the relative strengths and weaknesses of different primary literature sources. A narrative review might find a large number of studies, for example, that show that a particular therapy is effective, and without critical appraisal, it might not be clear from that review that none of those studies are very high quality or very reliable. So narrative reviews do incorporate opinion more than systematic reviews, but they do still serve a useful purpose. And then, as I said, cats or critically appraised topics are sort of a middle ground. They tend to be much more narrowly focused than narrative reviews or systematic reviews, often on very small specific questions. They're less comprehensive, but they do include formal search methods and formal critical appraisal methods, so that the evidence produced in a critically appraised topic is often more objective and less subject to bias than that, for example, in a narrative review. Critically appraised topics generally begin with the production of a question. We often use something called a PICO method to generate this question. We ask what patient or population are we interested in? What intervention or treatment are we looking at? Um, what is the comparison or alternative to that treatment that we're considering? And what is the outcome? What are we interested in finding out that this treatment does or does not do for our patients? Once you have that, then you go through the process of looking at the available research literature, identifying studies that are relevant to your question, and you do apply critical appraisal methods to those studies so that there is some incorporation of uh, awareness of bias and strength of evidence into the process. And then summarize those findings with a clinical bottom line. Um, there are, as I've pointed out here, some resources available to help you in the production of critically appraised topic reviews. There are also a number of sources of critically appraised topics in the veterinary literature. Best Bets for Vets is a site produced 
by the Center for Evidence-Based Veterinary Medicine at the University of Nottingham, and they are producing on an ongoing basis critically appraised topics that are of use to veterinarians. Uh, RCVS uh, Knowledge has also produced knowledge summaries, which are a type of cat, and those are ongoing as well. And they also provide a, a sort of a toolkit for veterinarians who are interested in contributing knowledge summaries to their database. So that's an easy way for veterinarians to get involved in producing research evidence. Uh, Banfield also has a critically appraised topic database, though I don't believe that's been updated recently. Clinical audit is not something that we think of as a form of research evidence, but it is in fact a, a way that veterinarians can generate research evidence that's useful to others in the profession while also evaluating our own practices. The goal of a clinical audit is to systematically look at particular procedures in the clinic and compare them to some sort of gold standard to identify areas for potential improvement. So the process looks something like this diagram. First, we try to consider what are we trying to solve. Uh, I might, for example, do a clinical audit on the complication rate associated with spay incisions in my practice. And then you go find some sort of gold standard in the literature if you can, whether it's a particular set of guidelines put together by experts or a set of statistics on the occurrence of certain complications. There are, for example, uh, published rates of complications from space surgeries available in the literature. And you compare the data that you collect in your own practice with that gold standard to see if there is potentially room for improvement. Now where this becomes a form of research is essentially that you can take this process and write a clinical audit report and then submit that for publication or share that with other veterinarians. It is in a sense a type of research even though it's traditionally considered more of a quality control method. One of the more familiar forms of research evidence that veterinarians may have experience producing are case reports or case series. These are descriptions of individual cases or groups of similar cases that you may see in practice. And these are often cases that are unusual, that have rare diseases, or for which you've tried a new treatment that hasn't been tested or evaluated scientifically in the past. Case reports are very useful because they're a great way of drawing the profession's attention to new problems or potential new therapies. They don't really have any control for bias. They are essentially a type of anecdote. And so I have to emphasize that case reports are not a very reliable type of evidence. They are useful for generating hypotheses, but we then need to go ahead and test those hypotheses in more structured controlled research designs. The advantages to writing case reports in case series is that they're often quite straightforward and easy to write. They provide a great learning opportunity for veterinarians because they make you think in a structured and critical way about your cases. They often require you to gather more information, diagnostic testing or historical information than you might otherwise gather for an individual case because you're planning on writing that case up for publication. So in that sense, they help you to improve your own clinical practice. And again, they're a great way of, of letting the profession know about new diseases or new treatments. Because they are essentially just a form of anecdote, I always have to emphasize that they do have a significant risk of bias. It is well known that the plural of anecdote is not data, and no matter how many case reports or case series we have in the literature, until there is controlled research on those diseases or those treatments, we can only generate hypotheses, we can't make firm conclusions. And finally, we come to clinical trials. When I talk about research and practice, the first thing most veterinarians think of is interventional research or clinical trials. This is obviously one of the most challenging and most difficult types of research to produce in general practice, and this is why I've saved it for last, because there are many other ways in which you can contribute to the evidence base that other veterinarians are using apart from interventional clinical studies. That said, it is absolutely possible for veterinarians in practice to generate this type of research evidence. And in, in fact, as I mentioned at the beginning, there are some significant benefits both to us as individuals and to our patients and to the profession as a whole if veterinarians get involved in doing clinical studies. Oftentimes, clinical studies done at academic universities, again, work with populations that are not representative of those that we treat in general practice. So if we get involved in doing more clinical trials, we will not only have more studies and larger study populations, which makes that research more reliable and more available, but also study populations that are better representative of our patient populations. It is also important to know that clinical research does involve learning a lot, and that makes us, I think, better clinicians. It also engages our clients in ways that I think are beneficial for us as veterinarians in practice. 
A clinical trial essentially takes a study population as a subsample of a larger population we're interested in. So if I, for example, am testing a new therapy for arthritis in dogs, I'm going to sample the dogs that come into my clinic with arthritis according to some very specific criteria, which will be outlined in advance for each individual study. And then I'm going to randomly allocate those study subjects to either the test treatment that I'm interested in or to some sort of control group, typically a placebo group. I will follow all of those patients forward in time and look at the outcomes, uh, whatever outcome measures are relevant. If I'm studying arthritis, for example, I'm probably looking at pain or mobility as an outcome. And then by statistically comparing the outcomes in those different groups, I can get information about the safety and the efficacy of the treatment that I am studying. As a form of evidence, clinical trials have some significant advantages over some of the other types of evidence that occur lower down on the evidence pyramid, such as case reports or clinical experience. Clinical trials by design are very powerful at reducing bias, confounding, and other sources of error. So they can allow us to prove cause and effect relationships. We can find out from a clinical study whether a therapy actually is effective in treating a disease, whereas we can only get the hypothesis that it might be effective from observing individual trial and errors with treatment of particular patients. It is critical that we have clinical trials for developing and testing new therapies. And there is a serious deficit of clinical trial evidence in the veterinary profession. Oftentimes we are using therapies that have never been studied specifically in a veterinary clinical trial. These may be therapies that have been tested in humans that we use off-label, or therapies that have been developed for theoretical reasons, but that we have never actually put to the test in the real world. So getting veterinarians in practice involved in clinical trials is critical for us to have the evidence we need to have confidence in the therapies that we provide and for us to develop new therapies for diseases that we cannot currently effectively treat. As I mentioned before, participating in clinical trials can also potentially be a source of revenue for veterinarians as well as a source of personal and professional satisfaction and growth. Now there are disadvantages to participating in clinical trials as a veterinarian in practice as well. They are complicated. You will have to uh, spend a lot of time and energy learning the particular protocol for a specific trial and in producing the paperwork and documentation necessary, complying with all of the regulatory guidelines involved. So taking on a clinical trial is definitely a commitment of time and effort. Clinical trials are also expensive and it's very difficult for practitioners to do these on their own in private practice. They must often be supported by either an industry sponsor or an academic institution because most clinical trials require resources beyond what we can devote in private practice. As I mentioned, they do potentially also take time away from treating patients, which can be a disadvantage if you have a high caseload and also from a revenue point of view. However, clinical trials are not only a great learning experience to participate in, but they're of tremendous value to our patients and to other veterinarians. And I encourage all of you to consider being involved in clinical studies if you can, because I think it's something that we really need more of in general practice. There are a number of resources available for veterinarians who are interested in learning more about evidence-based medicine or getting involved in research and practice. I encourage everyone to take a look at the Center for Evidence-Based Veterinary Medicine at the University of Nottingham, in addition to a whole collection of resources and publications that are continually being produced there. There is that critically appraised topic database, Best Bets for Vets, that I mentioned earlier, as well as a database listing all of the systematic reviews produced in veterinary medicine. Vet Compass is a network of private practices working in collaboration with some academic institutions and other players to produce research based on the electronic medical records collected in private practice. It's a wonderful example of how useful pragmatic research evidence can be generated in private general practice, and then that evidence is relevant to the needs of the patient populations in primary first opinion practice. The Morris Animal Foundation is a charity organization here in the United States, and they have created the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study. This is a longitudinal cohort study, so they enrolled 3,000 Golden Retrievers about eight years ago now, and these dogs are going to be followed through their entire lifetime. Every year, study subjects go to their regular private practice veterinarian, and they get a full evaluation, including laboratory samples, history, physical exam, and those veterinarians 
input that information into the study database. This is going to provide an unprecedented level of detail about the diseases and health conditions and life expectancy of these dogs. And that in turn also provides a wonderful model for how useful and important research can be done in private general practice. IVC Evidencia is a group of practices in Europe and they have created a research foundation that supports research in private practice conducted by private practice veterinarians. So there are a lot of options available if you're interested in learning more about how to get involved in research in your own practice. There are also resources if you want to learn generally about evidence-based veterinary medicine or clinical research. Mark Holmes and Peter Cockroft have produced both the Veterinary Clinical Research Handbook and also the Handbook of Evidence-Based Veterinary Medicine. These are very straightforward, easy to read, useful and practical guides to research and evidence in veterinary medicine. The RCVS Knowledge Group also has a toolkit for doing clinical audits and producing critically appraised topics and a lot of useful information for understanding how to do critical appraisals so that even if you're not producing evidence yet in practice, you know how to approach the evidence that is available to you and use it effectively in an evidence-based practice model. I still find the words that Dr. Rostell wrote 40 years ago inspiring and relevant to veterinary medicine today. I suggest that we must seek to elevate the status of the practitioner, not only in the eyes of the academic, but more importantly, in the minds of practitioners themselves. Those of us in general primary care practice often think of research or teaching as outside of our area of expertise, something better left to academics or specialists. But I think that's a mistake. I think that private general practitioners have a very important role to play in developing the scientific evidence that we need in veterinary medicine to take the best possible care of our patients. So I encourage all of you to consider ways in which you can get involved in producing research evidence that's useful to you and to other veterinarians. Thank you so much for participating in this session and watching this presentation, and I hope to be able to talk with you in more detail soon about generating research in private practice.